While touring his kingdom at the close of a century, Charlemagne found himself in the town of Apt, in the south of France. He was there during the dedication of the church. He had one of his notaries describe the remarkable events that day in a letter, which still exists, that he addressed to Pope St. Leo III. The church had been built on the site of an ancient chapel. Besides Charlemagne and his party, there was a huge crowd of noblemen. There were clergy, people, they are all present there for the rededication of the church. And this included a 14-year-old boy named John, who had been deaf, dumb, and blind since birth. He was the son of a local nobleman. During the ceremonies, John suddenly got up, walked up onto the altar with his walking stick, and began banging his stick over and over and over again on one of the steps of the altar. Obviously, whacking a step during the ceremonies caused quite a disturbance during such a solemn thing, so they tried to drag John off. As soon as they'd get him seated down, he'd come back up and keep whapping that same step and making signs that they should dig there. Well, Charlemagne pondered that. He was pretty amazed and impressed by the action of this young, deaf, dumb, and blind man that kept going to the same place and doing the same thing over and over again, so much so that after Mass, he commanded that the step that John had been whacking be lifted up to see what might be beneath it. So workmen soon lifted up the altar step as well as the huge stones that lay immediately underneath it. And everyone's amazement, as they started moving these huge stones, they began to uncover a door. And where did the door lead? When they opened it up, there was an ancient stairway descending down before their eyes. Where did the stairway go? Down to the crypt of the ancient church in which Mass had been said centuries before during the times of the Roman persecutions. It led down into that underground church. When the door was open, John, who by this time was hanging onto Charlemagne's hands, could barely be restrained. He started pulling Charlemagne forward as if he could see where he was going. In spite of the fact he's deaf, dumb, and blind, he's pulling him, and Charlemagne gave orders that the crowd should be held back, and then he allowed John to lead him down the stairs. John led Charlemagne down into the crypt and then over to a wall, and he began whacking on that wall with his stick again, over and over again. So Charlemagne brought, got the workmen there, and they pulled away that section of the wall. And when they did, then covered a long, dark passageway. Here was this narrow passageway that had been hidden behind that wall. So John led Charlemagne and his companions down that passageway. And at the end of that passageway, they came to another crypt where there's a walled-in niche. And to their great astonishment, in front of this niche was a burning vigil lamp. Now think about that. You can imagine how astonished that is. You've just uplifted up the altar step, removed all these stones, uncovered a door, gone down into it, taken on another wall, and then you get back there. Here's a candle burning in the underground like that, a burning vigil lamp. You've had a deaf, dumb and blind boy lead you to an uncovered, to a buried door, to a buried crypt, through a wall, and back to this wall in niche with the burning vigil lamp. And the whole crypt is filled with this unearthly, heavenly glow. So they're standing there pondering all these things when all of a sudden the vigil lamp went out. At the very moment the lamp went out, John miraculously received his sight, his hearing, and the gift of speech. This boy that had been deaf, dumb, and blind since birth could suddenly see, he could hear and speak. And his very first words were, It is she. It is she. Charlemagne didn't have the slightest notion what he was talking about, but he started repeating the words, and the people repeating them down the tunnel, and then all the way up above, and everybody fell to their knees. What was going on? Everyone saying, it is she, but who is she? The locals actually knew who she was. They knew that she was somewhere under the church. They knew that after the Roman persecutions, when the barbarians had begun to swarm over that region, she had been carefully hidden for safekeeping for many, many centuries. But they hadn't known where she was. Well, fine, Father, but who is she? Well, Charlemagne had the workers open up 
this little walled-in niche. And as soon as he began opening it, the air filled with this beautiful smell like an oriental incense. This sweet smell. And they could see laying there in the recess a wooden casket, a cypress casket was laying there. So they took out the casket and they opened it up. Here's this beautiful oriental cloth wrapped around relics. And in the relics, there's an inscription. The inscription read, Here lies the body of St. Anne, the mother of the glorious Virgin Mary. The relics of St. Anne had been miraculously rediscovered. That's the relics of the mother of the mother of God. It's the relics of God's grandma. The woman in whose womb the Immaculate Conception had been immaculately conceived. St. Anne, whose feast day we celebrated this past Tuesday. So Charlemagne, with all those present, spent a long time on his knees in prayer and venerated the holy relics, which had been so amazingly discovered. For three days, the people of Apt, who were struck by the great mercy that God had shown them and these miracles, kept a reverential silence, which to me in itself is as great a miracle as the rest, if you can imagine a town being very quiet and only speaking when necessary and then only in whispers. Charlemagne had an exact narrative of these events drawn up by one of his notaries and a copy sent to Pope St. Leo III with the royal seal. And this letter and the Pope's reply still exist. Okay, Father, but there's part of the story missing here. It's just how did St. Anne's relics end up in southern France in the first place? After all, it's not exactly a hop, skip, and a jump from the Holy Land to the south of France. How did they end up there? They were shipped there. How did that happen? Well, that also is an interesting story. We know it from tradition as well as divine liturgy. In fact, priests just read about this on Friday in their breviary. There's a brief version of the story in the Roman breviary, and it's also scattered throughout the Roman martyrology, and we know it from stories from sacred tradition. What happened was this. After ascension of our Lord and St. Stephen's martyrdom, in about the year 47, during the persecutions of the Catholics by the Jews, the Jews captured a whole group of Catholics, well-known prominent Catholics, and stuffed them into a boat without sails or oars or rudder and pushed it out to sea, intending, of course, that everyone on board would die. But instead, this crippled death boat miraculously landed with everybody safe and healthy all the way on the other end of the Mediterranean Sea in the south of France. Everybody climbs out healthy and safe. On board, they had the relics of St. Anne. So that's how St. Anne got to southern France. And as you can easily imagine, the arrival of a sailless, rudderless, oarless boat from the far stretches of the ocean with a cargo of healthy people on board made quite an impression on the local population of pagans. As the breviary for July 29th states, quote, by means of this miracle and the preaching of the Catholics, the people of Marseille and the surrounding regions were converted to Christ. Close quote. So besides the relics of St. Anne, who else was on the ship? Well, on the death boat was St. Maximinus. He's one of the 72 disciples of our Lord. Remember after our Lord chose the 12 apostles, then he chose the, the 72 disciples and he sent them before him two by two. Anyway, St. Maximinus was a bishop and one of the 72 disciples and he was stuffed on a boat. He wound up being the first bishop of what's now I, France. Along with him was St. Sidonius, who is the man born blind from birth. We read about him in St. John's Gospel in chapter 9. It's our Lord, where our Lord does a miracle very much like the miracle he did today in St. Mark's Gospel. He gives him sight by making mud with spit and, and lining his eyes with it, okay? And then remember, he's reporting to the priest, and they're saying, You're, you know, this man's a sinner. How could that happen? Okay, that's St. Sidonius. After the ascension, St. Sidonius was baptized by the apostles, and he's the companion of St. Maximinus. St. Sidonius was a coadjutor bishop of St. Maximinus and I and wound up buried next to him in the south of France. Okay, who else is on that boat? Another saint whose feast we celebrated last week on the 22nd of July, a notorious sinner who had seven devils driven out of her, who had stayed at the foot of the cross during our Lord's passion and death, and who was the first public witness of our Lord's resurrection, St. Mary Magdalene. St. Peter had entrusted St. Mary Magdalene to St. Maximinus. He was supposed to take care of her. So she wound on board this death ship as well. 
The fathers state that after reaching southern France, Marseille and the surrounding whole province was converted from paganism by the force of St. Mary Magdalene's preaching. She spent the rest of her life as a contemplative. She lived for 30 years in a cave in the mountains, praying and doing penance. Like St. Catherine of Siena and St. Gemma Galgani, her only food was the most blessed sacrament with the holy angels would bring to her every day. That's what she lived on. Just before she died, the holy angels brought her to St. Maxinus Chapel. Because God takes care of his friends. And St. Maxinus gave her the last rites and buried her there. In the year 710, when the Saracens invaded, her relics were hidden away by the monks, and they remained hidden until the rediscovery of them in the 13th century. They're confirmed to be authentic relics of St. Mary Magdalene by Pope Boniface VIII. They'd taken part of her jawbone and sent it to the Lateran, and then after it came, they rediscovered them to make sure they took the Lateran jawbone and they fit in exact, you know, the, the piece of missing jaw and whatnot, so they knew it was St. Mary Magdalene. Okay, so who else was on the death boat? St. Mary Magdalene's brother, St. Lazarus. St. Lazarus became the first bishop of Marseille, and after the conversion of his people from paganism, he ruled the church in peace. His feast day, which is the same as saying the day of his death, is December 17th. As the Roman Martyrology says for that day, and the Roman Martyrology is this liturgical book that we read every day during prime. It contains a list of the martyrs and the saints for that particular day of the calendar year. December 17th, it says, quote, at Marseille in France, Blessed Lazarus, Bishop, brother of Saints Mary Magdalene and Martha, of whom we read in the Gospel that our Lord called him his friend and raised him from the dead. Close quote, the Roman Martyrology. Okay, so who else was on the death boat? Another saint whose feast we celebrated just two days ago on Friday. It's the sister of Saint Lazarus and Saint Mary Magdalene, the Holy Virgin Saint Martha. After getting permission from Saint Maximus, Saint Martha devoted herself to a life of fasting and of prayer. Eventually she gathered a large congregation of other women around her to sing the Psalms and fast and pray in what we would nowadays call a convent. And her relics are found in Tarascon in southern France. So anyway, today we've learned a little bit more about Martha and Mary Magdalene and Lazarus and how God brought the true faith and the relics of Saint Anne to southern France and about how God brought about the rediscovery of the relics of his grandma. And going back to that story, it's a perfect example of how God uses the weak things of the world to confound the wise. God wanted to rekindle devotion to his grandma by uncovering her relics once more. So how did he do it? Right in the presence of the Holy Roman Emperor, the greatest military leader in the world, in the presence of all the great warriors, all these noblemen, all these big shots, the bishops and the clergy and the priests and the religious, all these faithful men and women, in the face of all the high and mighty of the world, who did God choose? A 14-year-old who's been deaf, dumb, and blind from birth. All right, those are physical problems, but we can all say that about ourselves in different ways, certainly spiritually. That's the whole great thing about our religion, is God will use us in spite of our different problems if we just let him, if we dispose ourselves properly. The very least he'll do with us is make us saints if we let him. That's why we're Catholic. He doesn't give that to everybody. But he gave it to us. Anyway, since that day, some 1,200 years ago, that St. Anne got her grandson to give the gifts of sight and hearing and speech to John, she hasn't let out for a minute, interceding for those who turned to her. When the very first chapel of St. Anne de Beaupre was being built in Quebec in 1658, Louis Guimont, who was a crippled man, wanted to express his devotion to St. Anne. He wanted to get in on building this chapel. All he could do is pack three small rocks to put in the foundation. So he goes hobbling up there. It takes him quite a while. He gets the three small rocks. He puts them in the foundation right before everybody's eyes. He's miraculously healed, just like that. Right now, there's a great basilica in that place. And inside that basilica are a number of miracle-working relics of St. Anne that came from France, including part of a forearm. There's piles of crutches and bandages that have been left at the Bonner Basilica by pilgrims who've been cured to 
through the incredibly powerful intercession of God's grandma. I personally know a woman who could no longer have children. So she made a pilgrimage there, prayed for a miracle, made a deal. Now there's uh, three more people in the world, and the girl's name is Anne. St. Anne is powerful. Those great saints and doctors of the church, St. Augustine, St. John Damascene, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Teresa Avila, all had big devotions to St. Anne. St. Teresa Avila used to say, quote, We know and are convinced that our good mother St. Anne helps in all needs, dangers, and tribulations. Close quote. Among other things, she's a patroness of the childless. She's the help of the pregnant. She's the protectress of widows. She's the mother of the poor. And she's the patroness of laborers. And that's a statue of her right there. And of course, uh, the little girl, that's Our Lady when, when she's young. And St. Anne, when we see that, what she pointing at is, is scriptures. It's a scroll sometimes, sometimes it's a book. And traditionally, I obviously haven't climbed up there and looked, it has Isaiah 11.1, 1, which is a prophecy about Our Lady on it. And she's traditionally pointing at that. So I presume that's what's painted on there. But anyway, you can look that up on your own time. But when we see that, we ought to think about what Our Lady once said about good St. Anne. Those who honor St. Anne... Will take, will receive aid in every need, especially at the hour of death. So we ought to turn to Saint Anne and beg her for help in all our needs. Is God going to turn down his grandma? Is Our Lady going to turn down her mom? Piles of crutches give answer to that question. We'll close with the words of a holy abbot who had a great devotion to Saint Anne. Quote. To St. Anne, God has given the power to aid in every necessity because Jesus, her divine grandchild according to the flesh, refused her no petition, and Mary, her glorious daughter, supports her every request. Those who venerate good St. Anne shall want for nothing, either in this life or the next. Believe me, if you love and venerate this saint, you will esteem how highly God esteems, you will experience how highly God esteems her. He grants all she asks. It would be impossible to enumerate the many graces she obtains daily for her servants. Close quote. To St. Anne, God has given the power to aid in every necessity because Jesus will refuse her no petition and Mary supports her every request. Those who venerate good St. Anne shall want for nothing, either in this life or in the next. If you love and venerate the saint, you'll experience how highly God esteems her. Good Saint Anne.